we bring the practice of huga into our lives, into our Christian lives? That's what we'll talk about today. Huga is the opposite of hustle. It eschews abundance. It savors. It takes things slow and envelops you in sanctuary. Huga is home. Jamie Erickson, Holy Huga. Today we're going to talk about the book Holy Huga, Creating a Place for People to Gather and the Gospel to Grow by Jamie Erickson. I did enjoy this book. I thought it gave a lot of really good ideas, and we're going to talk about some of those ideas. If you're looking for a different kind of viewpoint, I think it's interesting for us in America because we're so hustle and bustle all the time. And to take a step back, last year I did the book, The Dutch Act of Silence, which is still day of having that silence. In fact, I mentioned it before. I redid my recording room into a reading room, prayer room, craft room, and recording studio, all because of that book, Still Tay. I wanted a sanctuary. I wanted a place to get focus and to get quiet and to be able to do the non-work things in my life I was looking to do. This book kind of takes up after that. Of course, it's turning to fall and Huga is the time to think, hmm, is it time to settle down, get cozy, sit under a blanket and light a candle? That's typically what we think of. We also think about the pale colors, the simplicity, the minimalism in the room. That's important too. And in fact, in Start With Small Steps podcast, the other podcast I do, episodes 61 and 62 talks about these concepts of Huga and Lagom. We want that comfort. But this was with a Christian attitude in mind, this book. And she goes through a lot of talk about why Huga is a Christian concept. And I, that part of the book, I did not enjoy as much as how do we make it happen? How do we use this principle to be followers of Christ and to use it so that we can follow Christ? She got involved in this when she married someone of a Norwegian Danish heritage, godly man, she says. And she followed him up north, up my neck of the woods, and found out it's cold. She didn't have the sun like she used to have and considered it to be, well, quite honestly, bleak. To me, I love it. I love everything about being up north. It is my home. And when she talks about the wintry days and the cold, I love that. But for her, who came from a different place, it made her long for home. She didn't enjoy it. And she understood, she thought, the idea that when the children of Israel came upon a place that had bitter, undrinkable water, you just look around, she said, to make life sweet. And that's what she was trying to do with Huga in this Minnesota place. I suspect that the climate in the Norwegian area is much like Minnesota. We get a lot of Minnesotans and Scandinavians in this area because I think it is very similar. But she said that this practice that she got from her mother-in-law taught her a different way to look at life. And that she said that with this particular lifestyle, you can always change your circumstances At times, you can't change what's happening to you. You can't change where you live, but you can change your perspective on it. And your outer life, your surroundings will affect what's going on inside of you. Those are her two main principles when she was there. So she said that she looked to this to make Minnesota life sweet. As most words that translate from other languages, it's hard to define exactly the right tone of it. But she said that it's something about Hmm. This concept of having a lifestyle that creates peace and calm and quiet and taking what we may consider to be mundane, she says, into making it beautiful and meaningful. I think that's a good way to look at it. For example, when you sit by a comfy chair, she says, and then you have a fire this time of year, that's what I'm looking for all the time. I want to have candles. And now in my new room, my new recording room, I have that whole look of candles, of fireplace, of comfy blankets. And you know what? I didn't spend that much money to do this. This was not about money. 
This was not about materialism. This was about changing the viewpoint of a room that used to be a very bare bones guest bedroom that in general to me was an uncomfortable place to be. It made me sad a few years ago, there was a podcast that would take self-help books and try to live them out for a month and then see how they thought of it, how they thought it went and what they thought of it. And they labeled the whole concept of Huga and Lagom and all those as being privileged. You know, you have to have money and you have to be of a certain financial stability to do this. And you know what? You need a blanket. You need a candle. You need a nice lighting. And those things can be done on the cheap. You don't have to have a lot of money. And so it made me sad when they labeled it some sort of a privilege thing, when instead it is a way of life and a way to think about things. And she brings out the definition of it. There is a hugala, which is like the lifestyle of huga. There's other words in Netherlands, which I could not pronounce if I wanted to. Legom, which is what we did the podcast, then the one after the one I did on huga, which is a Swedish practice. There's German, which is gemütlichkeit. That's a whole kind of other concept because we celebrate in my neck of the woods gemütlichkeit during the fall. But she says in the end, the Danish people were considered to be among the happiest in the EU. And she said that this concept really welcomes people to come into your home, to enjoy your home and to be with you. And it's everything from fuzzy socks and flannel sheets and bath salts. Can none of this expensive? It's about gathering a quietness in a certain place. And you can do that whether you're living in an apartment that is very, very tiny in the middle of the densest city in the far south, or you're living in the North Woods where I grew up, or even in small cities. This is about your intention. And it is very easy to just sort of gather these things. Of course, having a fireplace, that's a bigger deal. But It's not important for all of it. In fact, my friend, she bought a little tiny fireplace. It looks like about nine inches large for $25. It's fake. Of course, it's fake. But you know what? It looks pretty good. And you can kind of get that warm feeling from it. So don't feel you are excluded from this. You are not excluded from this. This is all about that new way to look at your life. And she says, of course, it's important to know that Jesus brings everything that we need. You don't need Huga to be saved, to follow in his footsteps. But she wants to bring up some parallels to things she saw in the Bible that made her think of Huga specifically. First of all, there's hospitality. Jesus, of course, wanted us to have relationships with people. There is rest. There is reflection. There is prayer. There is other things that we're going to talk about in the course of this podcast and probably the next one where God wants us to have that kind of quietude, but also a place where we can escape to. Always kind of makes me think of um, where Jesus escaped to the olive grove. You know, when he was about to have a big day the next day, he would go find himself some peace and quiet and go and pray in the olive grove. I was in that olive grove and it was nice. I mean, obviously, it probably doesn't look the same as it did, but you know what? Remarkably, there's a very large church there right now but it probably looks very similar. And those trees that were in the olive garden that I saw were probably the same trees that were there when Jesus was there. It is a nice place. It is a good place to reflect. And Jesus brought himself out into those places. That's what this whole conversation made me think, that he had a place he could retreat to. And so when she talks about having Huga as a place where you can worship, that you can listen to sacred music, or even sing sacred music if that's your thing, this is a place for you. And she said that while we think of it home life and then work life and then this life, Jesus never split himself up into other lives, she said. We are to have one life, and that life is in him. And so having this place where we have comfort or we have quiet, I think is a good thing to have. She wants to remind us that when we think of the term homemaking, somehow we Ah, think about it as an old timey term. But in truth, God was the first homemaker. He made Eden and he made it for us to be in, a place for us to enjoy, a place for him to enjoy. He used to walk in the garden. So it was an enjoyable place to be. And so when you're thinking about homemaking, think about God as that homemaker 
And she said that if you're a Christ follower, you're a homemaker too. Because just like that book I did a review on, Christ is in our heart, which is his home. And we're called to lead other people there too. She said that the concept of Huga allowed her to think about miracles in the most simple ways and find God in those nooks and crannies everywhere and became a real spiritual practice for her. The first concept she would like to talk about is hospitality, that when we're kind to strangers, when we welcome people into our home, it is what God has asked us to do. The apostles suddenly were in each other's homes all the time. And in fact, Matthew, who I think didn't participate in his home or he had a home that he didn't use necessarily, suddenly Jesus was having him open up his home to people and bringing them in. He probably didn't want to do that before it happened, primarily because the people didn't like him very much as a tax collector. But now his home was a refuge for the people that were sharing the gospel and a refuge to the people they were sharing the gospel to. It's also that concept of having a meal together. You can think of many times in the New Testament where people shared a meal. And that hospitality is big in Denmark to the Danish people. They love hospitality. And they have what she says is a low rate of isolation and loneliness. While in a lot of places, we're starting to see huge problems with loneliness. I don't know. I saw it was in a line the other day and this woman was telling this whole big story about a computer and her dad. And I was waiting. <laughs> I thought, wow, I kind of wish you would get done with her story so I can check out. And then it struck me. What if this is the only social interaction she has all week? What if this is the only person she talks to all month? People are getting lonelier and it's not great. So This whole practice of making a warm spot in our home is not just for us, but it's also for sharing it with other people. She says it should be intimate. She also says that the Danish tend to do potlucks. And it's a concept in church, potlucks. You know, we bring all these meals and these lavish desserts, and there's a lot of food at potlucks. Even my work potlucks, there was so much food there. But she said that with the Danish people, it's more simple. It, it's just a small meal. Maybe someone would bring some boiled eggs and someone else would bring some leftover parts of their meal. And she said, too, that people use rustic uh, and fresh food recipes. I know a lot of times people at potlucks would bring like store-bought cookies, you know, and stuff like that. And this concept of you created something to bring, I think, is nice. I've never felt all that great about buying store-bought things for potlucks, but I think she has the right idea that this is for something that you're sharing that you make and then having the sippy drinks. That's going to be the mulled cider. Ooh, I love mulled cider. And hot cocoa. Mmm, hot cocoa. Coffee, tea, those steamy, she says, sippable drinks. Love that. And having what she calls a table fellowship, and Christ did that all the time, where he would bring his apostles along with him so that they could share in that fellowship. And we get scared because we think, what if they don't come? What if my house is too ugly or too small or too this or too that? And I get that. I have to tell you, I've not had someone in my home other than my best friend for years. My brother came over a couple of times, but for the most part, it's kind of why I got rid of the guest bedroom. I don't have guests. And it's that my house is kind of my own little retreat. If I meet someone, I'm going to meet them for dinner somewhere else. My home is kind of my private area of living. And for the first time in years and years and years, someone new is coming to my house. I'm having my friend from my last company over for breakfast. She's been making breakfast for me at her house. Her house is lovely. I'm self-conscious about it. I don't think my house is that lovely. I think it's very functional. (laughs) It's very practical. But now I'm starting to get there where I'm minimizing the amount of stuff I have. I'm going through every room and every drawer. But now I started with each room having a purpose. This recording, study, prayer room, lovely. I have a gym, exercise equipment, and mostly it's just a place that has some room so I can do something without banging into furniture. And of course, my bedroom, it's where I sleep. And now downstairs has become where I work. Sunny, it's bright, it gets lots of air. So I work down there. It's nice during the day to be in that room. And 
so you can see where everything is getting a purpose in my house. And so for me, this is a big move to have someone come over to my house. I would love, and I dreamed of it, I think I mentioned it in the podcast where we were talking about community, where I could be a place where I could invite people over. This is my first small step. She also says there's something called doorstep hospitality, which I've never heard of before, but it's the kind where you're just there for people to invite them over, to give them a meal, to just do something informal when they need your help, or maybe even bring them a meal when you need to do that. And I think that sounds great. And then she says sometimes people even will cook a meal together where they make something which she calls the everything soup. So one group might bring chopped meat, the other one bring chopped vegetables, someone else might bring the hot broth, and then together they make a soup together. What a, what a lovely idea that is. But this is in the end is all about building relationships with other people. And that's what we were told to do. Adam and Eve hung out with God in the garden and Jesus also hung out with people. He was about relationships and he wants us to be about relationships too. And so if we can get away from this distraction, and I think even the unuseful things that we get wrapped into. I like TV. I like playing video games. But in the end, they are non-beneficial. They don't help anybody and they don't help anyone feel better, have more community or anything like that. So she wants us to get into that part where we're reaching out to people, we're building relationships with people, and then we're even making disciples, she says. You know, that's where you're going to work with younger people or people who haven't been in the faith for longer and help people grow, help people grow into to better people. And so that whole concept of huga will give you a chance to help people do better, grow better, grow stronger together in a community. So we're going to close up this first episode of the Huga podcast, and then we'll continue next week talking about this concept again in some other detail. So my challenge to you, is there an area, one room in your house, that you can make it so it's distraction-free, quiet, maybe some candles and a blankie? Again, don't go overboard. This is not about buying a whole new room. This is about taking the room that you have and making it into a place that you can use as a refuge. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to listen to this podcast, subscribe, leave a review if you wouldn't mind, or tell other people, maybe in a Bible study or other small groups that you have, trying to grow the community. And hopefully they enjoy the podcast and hopefully this gives you some new perspective. And remember, that step to building bridges with other people starts with small steps.